Hello there and welcome to This Is Your Life. And those of you who saw Opportunity Knocks on Monday will know that it gave me a great opportunity to come through the back of their stage and surprise someone on that show. And this is what happened. <laughs> Incidentally, I, I, I don't know. You didn't give me a present. Uh, you didn't give me a present for uh, for this man over here. Well, but he's no, been very I'm kind. He's, uh, listen, listen. Well, open it. Open it. See what's in it. Open it here. Just open it here. Open it. Comes open that end. I think Frank it was very decent. Well, it was nice of me. It was Frank. It's a lovely thought. Yes, just creep. No, just don't. It's, it's a bit of Irish intellectual. Just don't. Open the whole thing. <laughs> Don't open any more of it, Les, because all the surprises are in there, because tonight, Les Dawson, this is your life. I'll tell you this, at least Les now knows it's for real. No gag, right, Les, yeah? <laughs> I've never been as shocked as the day I went to the Labour Exchange and was told there was a job vacant. <laughs> well, it really is for real, and this is your life, a life that's taken a bricklayer's son from Manchester along a tough road to stardom as a comedian. Now, tonight we surprised you on the set of Opportunity Knox because it was on that program only four years ago you got your first big break. So, before we go any further, let's hear from the man who helped you on your way to fame and helped us catch you tonight, Huey Green. Well, now, everyone, of course, knows, Huey, that uh, it was after meeting you that he started to hit the big time, right? Now, that was in 1967, but it wasn't a case of uh, stardom overnight, was it? No, it wasn't. <laughs> as a matter of fact, we do auditions, as you know, Eamon, all over the country, and we were auditioning in Manchester, and Royston Mayo, who is our director, he said, I have got a chap I've known for years. I'm not going to sit in on the panel today. He said, I just want you to give him a chance, push him in on the auditions. And he produced our friend over here. And he came up to me and he said, look, he said, I'm going to do this audition. And he said, if I fail, he said, I promise my wife I'm going to be, go back and be a bricklayer. Okay? So I, I loved him because he did something which was marvellous. He, he dressed specially for the audition, 10 o'clock on a wet Manchester morning. He put on his tails. You mean the same old tails he's still using? The same old tails he's still using. <laughs> <laughs> and he did his audition. And if you can laugh at 10 o'clock in the morning anywhere, I think you're funny. And we did one thing to him that we, we never do. I told him, I said, go back and tell your wife you're never going to be a bricklayer again. And they were right. Thank you, Huey Green. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now, Les, today you're a success and topping the bill in the pantomime Robinson Crusoe at the Alexandra Theatre in Birmingham. And soon your own show, says Les, is to return to our screens. So let's take now a look at Les Dawson, the comedian. Thank well, we've just had North Sea gas installed. <laughs> It's a waste of time. You can't light the stove unless the tide's in. <laughs> Not that it bothers the wife, because she's no idea of cooking. I wouldn't say she burns everything, but we lay the table with an altar cloth. <laughs> I'll never forget the time she tossed her first pancake. We'll never know she put in the mixer, but for the last seven years, we've used it as a pelmet. <laughs> See, I don't knock marriage, really. I mean... Marriage is very important. I mean, Mary, I've been married for ten years now, and that's a decade, and believe me, the wife's decayed, but... <laughs> well, now, if, if we believed all that, of course, it would appear that Les Dawson is the most downtrodden husband in Britain. It's not true, is it, uh, Les? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you say that, I feel, in a suggestion of safety, because you think your wife's at home in Berry and Lancashire. No, she's with a horse and cap. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's not, because as soon as the coast was clear... Uh, this morning, she took a train down and followed you here to London. Come in, <laughs> Mrs. Les Dawson. <laughs> well, 
about Meg. You've become very much a part of uh, Les's act. Tell me, what's it like being on the receiving end of all those gags? Well, it can be a bit embarrassing. Uh, one of Les's gags used to be <clears throat> that uh, his wife was like a girl, only she's Charlie. <laughs> so we used to go dancing. People used to be waiting around for me to stand up and see how big I was. <laughs> Well, now, Les, for every entertainer, there is one magical moment when he knows that success has arrived. Yours came just two months after that opportunity knocks that Huey was talking about. On July 30th, 1967, at the BBC, ABC Theatre Blackpool, during a show seen by millions of television viewers, you heard the compare say these words. Thank you, Les Dawson. Isn't he great, ladies and gentlemen? Let's bring him back for another bow. Dickie That's Hattis. the man, yes, who introduced you that night. He's Listen. broken Cinderella pantomime rehearsals in Nottingham to be here tonight. Comedian Dickie Henderson. Oh, wow. Now, that was obviously a very important night for Les, Dickie. Tell us what happened. Well, it was one of those wonderful nights that happens very rarely. The magic moment. I, I didn't know Les. Met him before the show, and he came on, an unknown quantity to me and the audience. And he started a bit slowly, and then he came out with some new material that we hadn't heard before. He even had new mother-in-law jokes. <laughs> he had one, I'll never forget it. He said, uh, my mother-in-law eats so fast that she has racing colours on a knife and fork. <laughs> True, true. <laughs> and after six minutes of this kind of material, he really did paralyze them. And he went off for a bow, and I could sense it. You get a sixth sense in our business, as Huey must know, that they wanted to stop the show for him. And on a television show, it's very difficult. But I said, right, here we go, come back. By this time, he was halfway up to his dressing room. But I was committed. And so we waited, and the applause held all that time while he got back on the stage. And it was a great night, and I was glad to be part of it. Jackie, one question. What do you think is the secret of Les's success? Undoubtedly, sex. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dickie Henderson. Thank you. <laughs> Well, that was the first experience of life at the top for Les Dawson. Now, the only son of a bricklayer born on February the 2nd, 1931 in Collyhurst, Manchester. But that bonny baby that we see here had a tough start in life. It's not me. That's you. <laughs> well, I'll ask both your parents are now dead, but they worked very hard to bring you up through the industrial slump of the 30s to boyhood and World War II. There you are. We have another picture of you in class 6A at Moston Lane Infant School. And during the war, while your father was with the army in North Africa, money was in short supply in your council house home in Lightbound Road, Moston. So short that when your local Boy Scout troop planned a 50-mile trip to Morecambe, young Les Dawson had to make his own way there. I was lucky enough to be treated to the train fare, but Les had to follow on an old bike. Yes, the voice of a fellow member of that uh, 56th Manchester Scout Troop, the boyhood pal, has remained a close friend today. Come in, Ken Cox. <laughs> Ken, tell me, were things really as tough for Les in those days as he said? Oh, I think they were even, even tougher. <laughs> Les and I, I think, had the distinction of being among the... How many scouts in the troop of this? And that bike of his. Where he got it from and how he made his, I don't know. There's even the tires patched up with pieces of Wellington boots. Then it should be deserted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know he, he jokes nowadays about saying that until he was 16, he thought knives and forks were jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kev Gods. <laughs> 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 Now, from a Boy Scouts uniform, you switch at 14 to the overalls of an apprentice electrician, and in your spare time, you turn your hand to amateur boxing. But as a teenager, the hands that we saw on the big gloves there were more adept at banging out tunes on a piano at home. At 18, you joined the Queen's Bay 2nd Dragoon Guards to do your national service. And shortly after you demob from the army, this piano playing that you're at came in useful. You get some bookings as a part-time singer and pianist in northern clubs and pubs. Then in 1955, you move to London in search of fame. And it's there that baritone singer Les Dawson makes this record. Oh, <laughs> 
Well, that recording came after hours of singing lessons, standing alongside a grand piano in a basement flat in Bassett Road, North Kensington. That was 15 years ago. But that same piano is still making music in that same flat. And those hands are the hands of the same person who gave you those singing lessons in that flat. Musical director of the Players Theatre at London now. I need hardly tell you, of course. It is Betty Lawrence. Hello, Les. Welcome to the Bassett Basement. <laughs> well, that song brings it all back, doesn't it? Do you remember me playing it here and you standing over there singing it in your dark, rich voice? I always knew you'd make it, and so did you. I'm absolutely delighted for you. See you soon. Yes, she'll see you soon because she's here tonight. Come in, oh, Betty Lawrence. That's it. <laughs> oh. Betty, that record, I Lie and Dream, has a special meaning for you and Les, doesn't it? Well, the song was written specially for Les, and he rather liked it, so we made that private recording which you just heard and hoped it might trigger off a singing career for him, but things didn't work out that way. And he went back to Manchester soon after, rather disillusioned. But he, he still wrote to me, and he always signed his letters, I lie and dream. So you see, he was still dreaming <coughs> of success, and I'm so thrilled, Lewis, that your dreams have come true. <laughs> Thank you very <Betty> much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, success was, in fact, just a dream in those days in London because times were so hard that you had to take a succession of jobs far removed from the world of showbiz. What, what sort of jobs, Les, did you, in fact, take? To bet you'd yak herder. I used to bed mice for a living. No, I, I did all sorts of things. I was kitchen porter in, you know, in big restaurants in London and... Babysitting anything to make a crust because you know things were so bad that I was my ribs were sticking out so much I became a hat stand. <laughs> well, gagging apart, he did take all these jobs, and in the summer of 1956, uh, a very disillusioned Les Dawson returns home to Manchester and back to the job that he'd quit to go to London, selling and servicing vacuum cleaners and washing machines. He's the only salesman I know to ask for time off to appear in a nude review. That's the man who in 1956 gave you your old job back, your boss for nine years, George Walker. Oh, no! <laughs> Where have you sprung from? <laughs> Out of a washing machine. <laughs> Tell us about the occasion when he asked for time off, George. Well, it was just after he came back from London, and I knew he hadn't got this show business bug out of his body, although he said he had. And he asked me if, he'd, if I could go on the Hume Hippodrome to appear in the Pauline Penny show, which was a new review, and he had, as a lead singer. And uh, you let him? I agreed, providing that he got his uh, work done for me, and there was no question about that. Yeah, he did. Oh, nice strip. <laughs> Being a brilliant salesman he was, of course, he, he achieved it. But this wasn't the last you heard of this permission. Oh, no. The morning after the first night, of course, I was calling to the office and by my boss. And he said, uh, he said, I went along to see a, a show in Manchester last night and uh, I'm sure there's one of your representatives on that stage. <laughs> I said, that can't be so. He said, well, you better go along tonight and find out for yourself. Did you? So I had to go along and sure enough, there was Leslie, surrounded by a naked girl singing Autumn Leaves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, George Walker. Thank you. Well, Les, I don't know what expression you were wearing during Autumn Leaves, but uh, would you mind telling us how you hit upon this uh, sad-faced expression that we all know so well now? How did you come to think that up? Well, it's only a stage image. I mean, in my private life, I'm a happy-go-lucky manic depressive. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing was that I was working a club in the North East a long time ago, and I died. I was dying so badly in India, they were calling me the fourth prophet. <laughs> and it began to dawn on me that really I was a flop. A complete flop. And so one night I got stoned before I went on. And I slumped on the piano and just looked at them and they looked at me and 
first thing I said was, it's a great pleasure to be in this reconverted kibber depot. <laughs> <laughs> and they just spent thousands on this place, which didn't help matters, but that was how it started, and it's been ever since. But I am a pessimist, I suppose. <laughs> Meg, do you remember the, the first time you met Les? Was it a romantic occasion? Well, not really. I went to a club in Manchester with a boyfriend, and uh, Les was with the artist boot for the night playing the piano. So during the night, I was asked to go over to Les to ask if he'd like to use a cleverly. And uh, when I went over to him, I said, would you like to use a cleverly, Mr Dawson? And he said, no, thanks, love, I've just been. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyhow, a year after that first spectacular meeting, Les, uh, you and Meg were married on June the 25th, 1960, at St. Thomas's Church, Crumsall, Manchester. Now, your popularity as a comedian brought you radio bookings and several television appearances until eventually you consider leaving George's firm and turning full-time <laughs> professional. And that decision, Meg, coincided with a very important family decision, didn't it? Yes, well, we're told we couldn't have any children. So we decided that we'd put a deposit down this new bungalow and then we'd blow the rest of our savings in and go to Paris for a certain honeymoon cycle. And then when we came back, we was expecting Pamela. Uh, Julie. <laughs> Julie. So now I've got three. A little girl, a little boy and a baby in five minutes. So if there's anybody out there that has any problems, don't worry over it. <laughs> That's Julie Stewart and, and Pamela. Pamela. Yeah. A complete fun-loving Dawson family. And the laughter in your home, Les, is often at its loudest when a friend of yours, and a particular favourite of the children, comes to stay and entertain them with this sound. <laughs> get down, get down. <laughs> it's baby Pamela's godfather. He recently scored a hit on the Royal Variety performance comedian Norman Collier. <laughs> Very happy uh, I, should have been, I should have been working tonight. Should you really? <laughs> the greatest no. job with you, <laughs> Norman, I know that you were very proud, in fact, when Les and Meg asked you to be godfather to Pamela. Oh. Tell us, why do you think they chose you for the job? Well, he wasn't getting enough laughs with the kids and good me. <laughs> <laughs> I think to make the baby laugh, I think it was the first time I'd worked in weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it was a marvellous time that day. But I always remember, because I used to stop at uh, Les's and Meg's, you know, when I was working in Manchester, it was very good because they used, they used to book digs and I used to move in. <laughs> <laughs> Get down. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Les is away somewhere and uh, uh, Meg wants to do some shopping. So she said, well, I'm just going out for half an hour. Would you look after the kids for me? She said, well, the, the marvellous kids, Stuart and Jewel, you know. Jewel loves dressing up and Stuart likes uh, doing the funny bits, like taking off Elvis Presley. So I'm watching the television. And uh, in walks Stuart in the lounge. He's got nothing on. He, he's um, <laughs> starkers. Of course, Julia follows him. She's nothing on. She <laughs> goes, oh, no, get your clothes on. So I chase him upstairs, down the stairs, out through the door and into the street. There's me chasing the kids up the street. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> when, when you and Les were there, in fact, I think you try out gags on each other, don't you? That's, I remember having a chat about looking for material. Like, when we did the... The visual bit, oh, yeah. in the swimming pool, on yeah. the water swimming. Remember that time? Yeah. How did this bit, remember? Yeah. <laughs> and he said, I bought the human balloon. Remember the human balloon? The human balloon, yeah. But, what do you do? Do it for me. Go, do, the do, the human, balloon, yeah. do the human balloon. Go, do the human balloon. Ladies and gentlemen, the human balloon. <laughs> It was Les Dawson, the family man, who in May 1967 walked into a television studio to make a final attempt to make his name in show business on Opportunity Knox. And you were more confident, Meg, than he was on that occasion, weren't you? Yes, well, uh, we had, you know, had um, coaxed him to go on to the show. And then, uh, but he always knew he'd make it because I had a £5 bet with him that one day he would make the Palladium. Well, make it he did, and after his success on Opportunity Knox and with Dickie and Blackpool came an appearance on Sunday night at the London Palladium in March 1968. And again, the man who introduced you was, in fact, Dickie here. You got a letter after that show, Dickie, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, you, you know you get fan letters. I haven't told you this <coughs> way. And uh, they blame me for the cast, and I'm only the compare. And this lady wrote to me and she said, Dear Dickie Henderson, I didn't enjoy your show, 
and I don't think you should have had that noisy drummer on, Les Dawson was the only decent thing in the show. But I could have listened to the singer with the band a bit longer. The drummer was Buddy Rich, and the singer with the band was Tony Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you're the best. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Now, Les Dawson had really made it and was now appearing alongside some of the biggest names in the world of show business. And in the case of one of those big names, he was right alongside, next to her, in bed, in fact, twice nightly, on stage at Blackpool. You know who I mean, Les, oh, don't you? Yes, and you're soon going to appear alongside her again because she's here tonight, Dora Bryan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dory, you must tell us more about this bed scene. Oh, well, uh, we used to do this sketch in the show, you see, and uh, it was ever so funny because when I first met Le at least I met him earlier, but um, when we started rehearsing for Blackpool, uh, he said, um, we're having a baby door on the opening night. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, heck, you know. So he was either in the telephone box or on stage. He was never anywhere else. He was always phoning Meg about the baby, eventually the baby. But, you see, we were uh, twice nightly in bed every night. Was, I always kept my hat on, Meg. It's all right. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's... <laughs> and, oh, I was fully clothed, really, you know. I, in fact, I had my gloves on, didn't I, Les? Yes. <laughs> I used to say, um, yeah, aren't you going to carry me over the threshold? Can you remember <laughs> oh, anymore? Yes. Yeah. And <clears throat> what was it? Oh, it's happened. And the bed used to collapse, you see, that... <clears throat> no, I won't say. <laughs> well, you had the baby. I mean, Meg had a baby. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, Meg had her baby. And, um, oh, it was... Like... Incidentally, did you get um, that... I, only you sent me those lovely flowers when I was at the Blade not long ago. And I lost your address on the last night, because it was a bit hectic that last night, yeah. that, but wasn't it, love? And I lost your address. So I sent a little postcard, yes, and, I, yeah, and I put Les Dawson, star of stage, screen and radio, Barry. <laughs> and it got there, did it? Yes. Oh, good. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Thank you, Dora Bryan. Thank you. Well, uh, shows like that you've been on with Dora Bryan have made the name Les Dawson a household name. Now, when you were given your own television show in 1969, it was the climax of a long, long, hard struggle to success. And when you'd reached the top, you were keen to give someone else an opportunity. And you remember some pals of yours. You remember a night in 1968 when you walked into the Mersey Hotel in Didsbury, Manchester, and from an upstairs room, you heard this sound. That's the night you spotted... Sid Lawrence Orchestra. <laughs> Together with singers and your first manager, Kevin Kent and Laura Lovelady, and of course, Sid Lawrence himself. Sid. <laughs> And you finished together, that's the great thing. <laughs> Come around here, Sid, where we can see you. Yeah. Now tell me, how was it that Les gave you this, this big break of yours? Well, it happened that I, I started a, a band just for amusement. We used to get together in this pub in Didsbury every Tuesday night. And apparently one night Les just happened to call in and he heard the sound, wanted to take a, a listen to it, yes? And uh, at that time he was beginning his own television series and for background music for the featured orchestra he managed to talk the powers that be into booking us for it and uh, I would think that that was the end of the rehearsal band more the beginning of the Sid Lawrence Orchestra and we've really moved on and I think the lads will agree that we owe a lot to Les Dawson Thank you Sid Lawrence, Lawrence. Thank, you. thank you I better tell you Les that uh, for the boys to come here and play for you, which they're going to, they've made a 300-mile detour between engagements in Weymouth and Exeter, and in a few minutes they'll be rushing off to catch a plane that we've specially chartered to Devon, where they're all due on stage later. But before your old pals of the Sid Lawrence Orchestra close your show tonight, we've one final surprise for you, or rather two, because when Meg followed you down here to London, she brought two of your greatest admirers. They've been hiding back here... <laughs> And we've had fun with them all afternoon and evening. Your six-year-old daughter, Julie, and four-year-old son, Stuart. Oh, come on, come on. <laughs> 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 
Les Dawson, this is your life.